Hello and good evening everyone. Thank you for joining us on our first ever Be Wild uh, live stream. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us on Facebook um, and also I'd like to thank very much our panel of experts who are currently hidden behind Zoom and are looking forward to telling you all about the projects we've been up to over the past year. So why are we here? Um, just about a year ago, uh, a huge group of people met in Buckfast Lee Town Hall to talk about um, all things wildlife, how we could improve and enhance the natural habitat that surrounds Buckfast Lee. And from that sprang the project Be Wild. Um, we had originally uh, planned an incredible um, array of presentations, workshops and guides coming up for 2021. And we'd planned out a whole um, programme of incredible trips out and practical projects we could do. Um, unfortunately, then, uh, with the lockdown happening in March 2021, uh, sorry, 2020, we had to revisit all our programme. And I have to say, I think um, I don't think we could have believed it would have been quite so successful. Um, we've run dozens of walks. Um, we've provided guides. We've fully integrated into Hello Summer and we've been able to achieve a huge amount getting people involved in wildlife across the parish. So tonight we're going to look back over that year and look at some of the highs. Um, we've got a short film coming up um, from Be Wild, from Robbie from Be Wild, um, followed by a series of presentations about some of the highlights of the year. After that, there's going to be a short chance to have a chat with the panel. Um, ask any questions and to look forward to what might be coming up in 2021. So um, with that in mind, if you want to ask any questions, uh, we're live on Facebook, so you can type your questions into Facebook and we've got a bunch of little elves behind the scene who will be able to pass those questions on to the panel. So keep your questions going throughout and for now sit back and relax and we can take a look at some of the highlights from the film by Robbie Phillips. Hello, well, welcome to the first of our Buckfastly Wild Watch films and this today we're going to look at uh, cob bricks and bees. If you have these plants in your lawn it's really encouraging because it suggests you've already got a wildflower meadow. Well, it's worth getting up early in the morning to listen to the dawn chorus. It's absolutely fantastic thing to hear just listen to all those birds all around us. Hi, my name is Barney and I'm an ecologist at the Donkey Sanctuary and I'd like to talk to you about grasses. Grasses are extremely important. They provide habitat and shelter to all sorts of wildlife and invertebrates. And when it's all thoroughly mixed in, mix it with your hands up. This, all you've got to do then is just make it into a brick shape. So I've got a little mould here. For this Buckfastly Wild Watch film, I've got up very, very early. I've wandered up to the old church on the hill to listen to one of the wonders of nature, Dawn Chorus. One of the classic calls of Henbury Woods at this time of year is the Willow Warbler. There's a lovely little fluty whistle, sort of descending, slightly sad sounding, but it's a beautiful little bird. You can hear the male singing up in the top of the tree. Good morning and welcome to the latest Buckfastly Wild Watch film. I've got up early for this one, and this one's called Moth Trap Morning. It flaps around and 
puts those white antennae forward and then flicks its wings and then shows off that bright pink sort of wasp-like body. Not amazing if we touch it, pretend to be a bird trying to peck it. It does this amazing display, fantastic thing. That was fantastic, Robbie. Thank you for making that beautiful film and for everyone who made the original long films that you can see still on our Be Book Fastly and Be Wild YouTube channels. Um, starring in many of those films, uh, a lot of you might have recognised renowned naturalist John Walters. Um, he's uh, the brains uh, behind all sorts of the wildlife projects, but in particular this year, He's been working on the eight wildlife guides we've produced specifically for Book Fastly. So John's going to be able to uh, tell us a little bit about producing those now. So over to you, John. Yeah, OK, hold on a second. Uh, right. Whoops. Right, hello, everyone. Hope you can all see me um, and welcome this evening to uh, Obviously, Wild Watch guides, and uh, what I'm going to talk about in um, the next few minutes is the guides we produced, and we produced started producing them in the spring, and uh, we've been producing them right over through the year. And um, just I'll take you through the guides and, and talk a little bit about uh, why we produce them. I mean, as Pam said earlier, uh, first first thing you know is uh, we needed to uh, expand the knowledge of wildlife. Uh, that uh, I, I possess, I've, I've been studying wildlife, I've lived in Buckley for about 30 years now, and I've been studying the wildlife of the area, so all sorts of things from long-tailed tits up in Henry Woods to frogs and spiders and all sorts, I've been, I've been studying that over the years. So it's nice to share some of that knowledge through the guides. And the first one we produced was uh, on, on the spring flowers. Uh, this is a, a drawing of a Deptford pink. Uh, this one is a, a summer flowering plant but I'll talk about that one in a minute but during the lock during the lockdown we had the uh, a lot of people wandering around the lanes so uh, it was it seemed an appropriate one to produce first so uh, in the springtime lockdown started in March and we had all these lovely flowers lots of people walking around and that uh, seemed a good one to produce to uh, enable people to identify some of the flowers and we got an amazing variety of flowers that you can find in the lanes and hedgerows around Buckfastly all within walking distance of the town. Uh, then we moved on, we got the uh, SWIFT project, which David will talk about shortly. And so I produced a guide to accompany that. So we were hoping to have, well, we did have a, a, a very small SWIFT festival. Um, so this accompany that and hopefully next year when we're able to get out and about, we'll be able to actually take a few more people out and actually show them some of the, the things that were in these guides, such as the SWIFTs and swallows. Then I was thinking about which other uh, groups of animals and plants I, I could produce a, a meaningful guide to and one of them is the butterflies of course so I produced a guide which has got all of the butterflies and a few of the day flying moths which you will find in the Buckfastly area and then I moved on to producing a guide on the the, the early summer flowers so uh, this is the um, the depth of pink and uh, all the other flowers which flowers sort of during early summer so this was uh, a particularly nice one to produce and uh, we've got a, a, an amazing variety of flowers and there's, there's probably still more guides I can produce along the other uh, lines of the plants that we get. Uh, then I did an, another one on the mini beasts and again I've only covered some of the mini beasts so this, in this one I produced some of the grasshoppers and crickets and uh, also the um, some of the things like the stick insects which we get here so that's a, a real um, I'm not sure if you can all hear me actually. Um, and uh, then uh, Joe's guy and Joe will be talking about the hedgehog shortly. Uh, so I'll pass over that one. And then there's a guy to bats and someone will be talking about the bats later on. Of course, the great horseshoe bats are one of the most important uh, wildlife, uh, some of the most important wildlife to be found around the town. And the most recent one was one on mushrooms, uh, which Pam produced. And I'm sure a lot of you have used this guide wandering around at this time of year. 
looking at all the amazing mushrooms and toadstools you can see. And uh, just finish off by talking about which other guides I may produce over the, over the years. So I've been thinking about doing one on garden birds, um, more of the mini beasts such as the pond life, uh, dragonflies and things like that, as well as other you know, pond life such as frogs and toads, and newts, and also during the winter, winter trees, and then doing another guide to the trees in the, in the spring as well. And also one on bees and other insects. But if you've got any other suggestions for guides, uh, please pass them through the comments on Facebook and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, thank you for listening and uh, I'll pass you back to Pan now. Thanks, John. That was really great. And I think um, sitting in the living room and hearing uh, the feedback we've had from those guides has been incredible. Everybody, young, old, residents and visitors have been blown away I think that we've had such great quality uh, guides specifically for book fastly uh, it's just been fantastic so thank you John I know um, we've been very lucky to, to have you doing that over summer thank you very much okay thanks very much and I'll disappear now Goodbye. thanks and I think following off from the wildlife guides it's good now to go on to Becky Erickson so a lot of you will know Becky Becky's the brains behind Hello Summer and Hello Autumn and Hello Spring and Hello whatever else we can we can bring together. Um, and uh, this year, Becky's had the extra job of weaving in all the um, Participate Arts Hello Summer packs into the Be Wild schedule. So uh, Becky's been really successful with her partner, Gabby, uh, in joining up on a number of projects. So we're going to hand over to Becky now to see some of the, the best bits of Hello Summer and wildlife. Over to you, Becky. Hi, thanks, thanks Pam. Yes, so, um, so since the beginning of lockdown um, and Hello to Summer not being able to um, run live with workshops, we've switched over to providing packs, which originally went out via the food bank and the emergency COVID response team. Um, and have just gone on from strength to strength. I think we've done um, approaching 4,000 packs now, including a pilot in the summer. So where we, where we could, we've, um, we've linked in with, um, with the Be Wild group um, and especially with the guides that have gone out. So I'm gonna try and share my presentation now, hopefully. Um, and let's see if I can press share screen, sorry. That. Uh, is that working? I can't tell from here. <sighs> Sorry. Um, also, we uh, we began with. Don't know if anyone can send me a message to see if that's working. But we um, we began with the flower presses. Um, which uh, went down an absolute storm. We ended up having to make another extra um, 50 um, because people loved them so much. Um, so they were a make your own flower press and they worked in really well with the, um, with the guide to early flowers. Um, we also did one on recycled materials, uh, uh, moths, the moths pack are working with recycled materials. Um, we were, um, yeah, we often work with recycled materials, which ties in quite nicely with Be Wild as well, um, because, uh, yeah, good for the environment. Um, we had two swift ones. So the first ones were when the swifts arrived, so that we did swifts on a string so that kids could uh, swing them around and uh, look out for the swifts coming into Buckfast Lee. Um, later in the year, there were the pinecone hedgehogs. Um, so yes, little felt faces um, with yeah on pine cones as you can see and um, and they tied in with the hedgehog um, festival which Joe is going to tell you a bit more about and then later in the year there was the swift festival so for that we encouraged everybody to make transparencies to put in their windows um, and to send us in pictures of themselves uh, with their with their transparencies and that was also a massive success people loved it and I think it really raised raised the awareness of swifts in the town um, and we all learnt a lot about telling the difference between swifts and swallows. Um, and we had some badges too that went with those. Um, then after that, we had the bats. 
So that involved uh, bats that you could stick in your windows, also bat masks, um, and also a bat colouring in competition. So, um, which was really lovely as well to, to continue the love that I think everybody's <laughs> developed for these bats in Buckfastly um, over the last few years. Um, we did do an extra one, which was not directly linked to Buckfastly, but we, um, to the bee Buckfastly guides, but we, uh, we also did one about bees and weaving. Um, some B shapes. Um, so yes, I think I can stop screen sharing now. Um, yeah, so it's been really brilliant to work with uh, Be Wild uh, this year and um, to bring in families and the yeah the younger generation into all the great stuff that's happening um, with Be Wild and with all of the wildlife and especially during lockdown when people are have like has like John said have already been right out there much more in wildlife maybe than in in an unusual year so um so we're hoping to carry on that uh, um with hello summer to link in with packs that will be coming out and keep on um yeah yeah tying the two things together and bringing in families more so i think that's all from me so yes thank you very much thank you becky and uh thank you for everything that participate arts has done uh, how quickly you adapted to the new world and um, brought so much joy to, to families in town. It's just been incredible to see. And um, with that, I'm going to next up is uh, our resident ornithologist, uh, Robbie Phillips, who's uh, not only a whiz on the camera, um, but has been leading um, originally pre-lockdown uh, to some bird walks and then the bird box building project that we uh, we did back in early spring. So I'm going to hand over to Robbie now and he can tell us all about that. Over to you, Robbie. Thanks very much, Pam. Hello, I'm Robbie. Um, my speciality is birds and surprisingly this evening I'll be talking about some of the activities that I've been doing with Be Wild regarding uh, birds. <laughs> so let me just share my presentation with you. Yeah. So there's two activities that we managed to get in before we went into lockdown and that was a bird box building workshop and also a couple of bird walks we managed to do as well with myself and John Walters. So the two bird box building workshops we did were held in Victoria Park and they were targeted really at um, the local community, particularly families. And we had actually, we had over 50 people attend the two sessions and 15 of those were families with 25 children. So lots of children got to come along and have a go making their own bird box. And most of them were making it for the first time. They'd never done any woodwork before as that's not something that's done in schools nowadays. And one of the things that was really nice that um, some of the parents were saying was that it was great for them to learn new skills whilst having fun at the same time. So they're all supervised and made sure no one drilled anything they shouldn't have. And it was all very carefully watched, but they had a great opportunity to learn some new things. So in total, we made 45 boxes and um, each family had the option either to take the box home with them to put up in their own garden or where they wanted to, or they could donate it to the community. Um, during each session, most people had time to make two boxes and therefore most people took one home and also donated one to us to put up. So with these extra boxes we had, oh, first of all, <laughs> um, they also had a chance to paint the boxes so everyone could do their own painting design and if you go to Victoria Park, you can see these painted boxes are placed up around the park there. So with the boxes that were donated to the community, we put up six in Victoria Park that are still there. And the rest went to a place called Northwood, which is um, adjacent to Henbury. And we put up the rest of them there that were put in March. And within five days of the first ones going up, we already had some blue tits starting to build in some of the boxes. Um, in the boxes themselves, we had at least eight used. We're not quite sure what used the ones in Victoria Park, but in the Northwood ones, eight were used. And they were used by blue tits, great tits, and really impressively were by two pied flycatchers. So these are really quite rare birds and it's a local speciality of the area. And these two pied flycatcher nests managed to fledge 12 chicks and all the other boxes managed to fledge a further, a further 30 chicks in total. So we also managed to do a couple of bird walks back in January. And the aim of these walks was to get people out and active, but also getting them immersed in nature and getting to see all of the new wildlife that's just on their doorstep. So we had 25 people attend these with two walks. I led one and John led the other. I led one in Henbury Wood, and we covered four kilometers and saw 25 species during this walk. 
and the highlights had to be the goldcrest and firecrest which are Europe's smallest birds but we did also manage to see a couple of woodpeckers which was great and John also led one of these walks around the local community starting from Buckfastley and going up around the church so thank you very much for listening and I'll leave it with that thank you Pam Thank you, Robbie. I'm so delighted to hear that the bird nests were, the bird boxes were used in the wood and to have pied fly catchers in them too. Um, yes. Amazing. I do think if, if, um, if you've got these boxes at home, anyone, um, we'd really like to hear whether your bird boxes were used uh, during the season. So if you were lucky enough to get a box and have one in your garden, do drop us a line and let us know, please. Um, and one of the other very special things in Buckfastley, um, which is something we often just don't take much notice of, is we have some incredible verges, the roadside bits of grass and patches of land between the fields and the roads. And we're very, very lucky to have an expert, uh, Tracy Hempston, Hempston, sorry, Tracy, um, who um, were very fortunate, um, was made uh, fur on furlough over summer and chose to spend that time surveying uh, the very precious verges of Buckfastley. So I'm going to hand over to Tracy and she can tell us what we sh what she found. Hi, hope you can see me and um, some flowers. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour really of um, some of the things that we got up to this year despite, uh, despite lockdown really. Um, so um, as John mentioned, Deptic Pink earlier, um, I'm sure you will recognise this verge here, which is home to a really large population of them. Um, and this is a really important nationally as well. So it's our kind of special flower for that fasty. Um, but more kind of um, why are we sort of interested in verges generally? Um, so from a conservation point of view, across the UK, they're home to about half of our wildflower species. Um, because of the nature of them as well, they provide a really good network for wildlife to sort of move through the landscape across the um, across the country. Really, um, they're also one of the um, chances that people drive in past, or if you're lucky enough to have really nice birdies within your town, like we are, and um, it's a really good opportunity for people to have sort of place access to um, wildflowers and all the the insects and things that come with that. And we know that these things are really important for kind of health and well-being. Um, and also, um, some you don't really hear too much, but actually when you restore um, poor kind of species, poor grasslands, um, it actually increases the capacity for carbon storage. So our super lovely species rich edges are really good at um, sequestering carbon. Um, so in Buckfastly, we've sort of got two main kind of um, aims I suppose really. Um, the first one is really to do with the amazing verges that we already have. So some of these um, are really species rich, lots of flowers, um, but over time um, if these aren't cut or if no one does anything with them, which is what's happened a little bit, they turn into sort of big bramble thickets which we have got in some places. But the other side of it was also to look at a few of the more species poor verges and see whether we could actually kind of improve those. And that really good opportunities for kind of community projects to enhance some of those areas for wildlife, but also for us as well. And those are the sort of things that we're planning for um, next year. So if we just look at one of our flowery verges, you'll have to forgive my photography. It's not my <laughs> forte, not like Robbie's wonderful videos. Um, but this is a uh, high mill lane, so this is a really nice example of a really flower rich kind of area. Um, and if you're familiar with walking along here, you'll know that there's big areas of bramble. So this is one of those bits that does need an annual cut just to keep it looking like that, full of butterflies and bees when I walk past. So the other side of things is kind of maybe looking at a few of these slightly more green deserts that look a bit like this, or maybe even a bit like this. Um, and seeing whether we can turn them more into something that looks more like this with, you know, lots of beautiful wildflowers. Um, and this particular one is absolutely alive with butterflies and bees, grasshoppers and all sorts of other wonderful things in the summer. So how did we make a start? It was quite a big sort of thing to undertake. 
Um, well, during lockdown, lots of uh, dog walks and things came in handy. Um, and we started mapping where all the verges were. And we've created an online map that you can go and have a look at and you can click on it and you can see pictures and find out more about the verges. Um, this is something that we want to add a lot more wildlife sightings to in the future. So this is a bit of a work in progress. Um, and once we knew where the verges were, we actually went and surveyed all the plants that were growing there. So we did sort of full plant surveys on, on the verges. Um, so how did we get on? So, so far, um, we've done our mapping and surveying. We got up to about 80 plant species, which is pretty good. Um, a lot of those are on what is called our special bird, which is actually that bird with the, the pinks growing on it that goes up over the hill. Uh, and it's designated special because of its um, really species rich habitat, all the wild flowers that you see there and and also particularly because of the, the pinks. Um, so that was really good. Some of the other verges were pretty good as well. Um, we also did a bit of socially distanced raking um, a few times, and here's some of us, the Hannah Elliott playing, which is quite good fun. Um, but really we're at that point now where kind of next year, we really want you guys to come and um, join in really, and hopefully we're gonna have lots of really sort of fun and nice, activities that we can um, really kind of improve, if you like, some of the green spaces and verges around town um, that are going to look fabulous sort of along, um, along the edges of our roads. So it's a bit of a whistle stop tour and I think there's going to be some um, links to get in touch with us at the end of the session. And also if you've got any questions, then um, yeah, I think we're doing that at the end of the session as well. So. I shall say goodbye for now and hand back to Pam. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy, and um, brilliant job on that. And as Tracy said, everyone, um, obviously there's verges all over town. We really need your help with this. Um, we we first of all need people maybe to let their let their patches of ground outside their houses uh, thrive. Um, and to thrive in the right, right way, um, it's worth contacting us because we've got all these experts who can help you turn a barren strip of, of scrubby land into something that's a really great space for wildlife. So do let us know, do let it go a little bit wild and do get in touch with us if you would like to be part of that project that can make um, places flourish. Um, and now we're gonna to speak to uh, David Harbour. David has a beautiful project about a very special bird, um, but Fastly is actually a very big stronghold of the swifts. They're the birds that we hear screaming over our heads in summer, and um, they're very precious in Book Fastly. And David's going to tell us about the swift project that we ran this year. So over to you, David. Thank you. Um, thanks, Pam. I hope everyone can see me. Um, just to introduce the project, it's um, emerged out of a collaboration with um, Be Wild and Participate, and certain aspects of it were sort of underway before I uh, came around. And um, I'd, it had been in the background of my mind for a long time to think about Swifts because uh, it's close to my heart. Um, and I've noticed that the uh, population of Swifts and humans very much overlap. And this graphic shows you that you can see um, that all the major towns are highlighted. And if you look in the bottom left hand corner, you can see Torbay and the Swifts and the humans cohabit the UK. So in a, a strange way, the Swift population exists because of or in tandem with the human population. So in some strange way, the um, U UK population of Swifts is not natural. It, you consider it, or you could almost consider it as an artifact. So, in the epoch of the Anthropocene, I thought it was interesting con to consider kind of nature as perhaps not nature. But perhaps the problem with the nature in the traditional sense is that it doesn't exist anymore, even. And, uh, you know, every in quotes natural form now is a sort of product of climate change, and which, which is human made. So, in this project, we're, we're aiming to conserve um, the human and the swift hybrid ecology and uh through by doing you know in that 
mode, we've um, collaborated and there's a sort of mini network of people forming around the Swift project and there's a network forming around the uh, Be Wild. And so it's a kind of network of networks and it's quite a small project as yet. We've um, done a certain amount of recording of what the, what the Swifts are up to. And um, we've had, I've, I've done over 200 um, individual observations, got um, seven proven nest sites. And the largest group of Swifts, like I called a screaming party is um, 34. And early in the season, we had um, this uh, small celebration as John uh, pointed out. And this is a, a sort of audio visual installation, partly by myself, partly by Charlie, who'd done the lovely um, graphics at the bottom and partly by Tim and instigated by Pam. So there's a lot of people working together to make something quite succinct. And um, this coincided with the celebration event and that began my um, set of six swift walks, which um, sort of performed a bit of swifting and um, highlighted the differences in, in ecology, of behavior, breeding, nesting of the three kinds of birds that can easily be mistaken for one another. And this coincided with another collaborative element, which has been covered already with Becky and Gabby at Participate Arts, who've done, you know, that amazing thing that they've done with Hello Summer, and it, we, Swift Project sort of joined in with that. And this was at, in uh, mid-June. And then um, uh, John, um, I was hoping this slide would move on. Oh, yeah. Oh. Being a bit glitchy. I was going to just show John's leaflet, but uh, John's show, it, I think, rather leaflet. Um, having a bit of trouble with it, being full screen. Well, that's me. That's John's lovely leaflet on um, how to ID the birds. And then this is uh, one of the swift walks and um, reached only 35 people all together. And, um, and then later on, we bought um, eight RSPB boxes and we installed four of them. Um, and that's um, another miniature network forming around um, the idea of hosting Swifts, which is, you know, myself, Virginia, Blake, Joyce, Joe, Muskie and Richard, Charlie, Victoria, Liz, and many others, Andy. So it's, it's, a, it's a good kind of sense of like building a community around a value or intention, which is good, great stuff in its own way. And then we've got ambitions for next year, which is um, to install some audio callers. And this is me installing the boxes where I should have mentioned those slides. And this is a, what, a Swift caller. And um, we're gonna, this is a standalone device for making Swift sounds. We're gonna put some more boxes up. We're gonna uh, introduce an international networking element um, to consider you know, the global ecology of both the human and the Swift, because you know the micro macro thing. And um, hopefully, can uh, with a tiny bit of funding, can collaborate again with Participate Arts to make some more of those lovely, you know, engaging things that they've done. So um, that's me. I'm going to stop sharing now. And uh, thanks for listening. Brilliant work, David. Thank you so much. And you know, we had such plans to have a, a big live Swift Festival and a procession, even to welcome the birds back to Book Fastly. Um, that wasn't to be, but I think the project and getting the bird boxes up um, and plans for next year have just been, um, are just going to be really great. And this is something we can build on. So, David, that was great. Thank you ever so much. Um, just um, a little reminder, please um, keep asking your questions on Facebook. Um, if you pop questions in there, we'll be putting them to the panel once the presentations are finished. And um, thank you to Shelley Mills, um, who's contacted us to say that um, if we're interested in the verges in Tracy's uh, verge project, uh, whether the home ed group might be able to get involved in the verge management, which would be fantastic. And if you do want to contact us, um, the best email to use is um, bookfastlybewild um, at gmail.com. And that email address will be up on our Facebook page and website, uh, but you can email us there, join up to our newsletter. And if you'd like to get involved, uh, do let us know. So we've got two more presentations coming up. 
Uh, the next one is from Joe Swift, uh, appropriately enough, but it's not about Swifts, it's about hedgehogs, a uh, much more recent project. So over to you, Joe, please. Hello, I'm Joe Swift and I volunteer with Be Wild. I'm going to talk about the hedgehog project that we carried out in the summer. So what we do, we produced a leaflet with information about hedgehogs and lots of tips to make your garden more hedgehog friendly. With Hello Summer, we distributed activity packs which contained the leaflet, a craft kit to make a cute pine cone hedgehog, colouring in sheets and a prickle promise. Hello Summer also created Hetty the Hedgehog who sat in the living room and anyone could add a prickle promise as one of her spines. These were a promise to do one thing to improve life for hedgehogs. We also made hedgehog homes. These were built by our handy volunteers. A huge thank you to everybody who helped and a very special thank you to Ron and Frank who cut, hammered, roofed and painted over 20 boxes. These boxes have been given to people who applied to have one for their own garden and some were also placed in community areas. One even went to the fire station. If you'd like to know more, you can borrow children's books about hedgehogs from the living room. You can still pick up a leaflet from there too. You could visit Hedgehog Street to learn more or to sign up as a hedgehog champion. And do look out for more activities about hedgehogs next year. Thank you. Fantastic, Joe. Um, Joe, uh, not live with us today. Um, but very much online to answer questions later on. Hedgehog Project still very much the topic at the moment. Um, you'll see on our Facebook pages, there's lots of guides for looking after hedgehogs, watching out for underweight hedgehogs. And of course, with bonfire night coming up, asking people to check uh, before they light their bonfires. Um, so please do keep an eye out and uh, watch for much more coming in spring about hedgehog projects. Um, now, the next project is going to be, uh, the next presentation is mine. I'm very much hoping that I'm going to be able to see my presentation slides at the same time, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to. Oh, I am able to. Excellent. That's brilliant. Um, so Tim uh, Dollymore behind the scenes is dealing with all the uh, presentation and um, I'm going to talk to you about Buck Fastly's Greater Horseshoe Bats, uh, something, as I'm sure you're all aware, is uh, uh, very close to my heart and very close to my house, which is even easier. So we've been um, watching the Greater Horseshoe Bats, myself and Phil, my husband, for very many years now and counting them as they go across the road. We're really lucky this year to be able to still take people out to see these amazing creatures. We've been um, uh, running uh, informal walks and talks for a long time. But what was really special this year before lockdown was we were able to gather a group of 12 volunteers who all wanted to learn to become um, uh, uh, tour guides for the bats. So we'd actually done quite a lot of work on uh, teaching the guides about the bats and how to take them out to, to see people. But unfortunately, of course, we had to then massively adjust what we do and reduce the numbers down. So during September, we were able to run bat walks in uh, every Thursday and Sunday. We ran um, nine guided bat walks and we had seven new volunteer guides. We were able to take out bat detectors so we could hear the bats and see them. And we took over 80 people out in September alone to see the bats. And this year at the peak, crossing over from the caves and Churchill over towards the Millennium Green, we had over 1,300 bats coming through. Um, we were able to celebrate um, uh, the uh, end of the International Bat Month at September with a visual display in the living room. And uh, we were delighted to be awarded the Devon Wildlife Trust uh, Devon Bat Project Greater Horseshoe Bat Friendly Community Award just a few weeks ago. So um, we'd like to thank everyone who's worked hard to uh, develop their gardens for insects, been out on the walks and helped protect the environment that these very special bats uh, live in. And this last slide here is 
um, some of the winners of the colouring competition. I think safe to say some of the biggest bat fans in town and um, very well deserved uh, presence there from uh, Anna, David, uh, the Devon Bat Project. So a really lovely project which engaged so many people and brought a lot of attention to our town. So watch out again in spring when the bats start to emerge. So that's it from me on the bats. And that's actually the end of our presentations for the evening. And I might say as well, we are bang on time, everybody. So um, really well done. I'm going to introduce you now to uh, Donna Cox, who I think some of you will know from around um, More Meadows and a lot of the work that Donna has been doing up at the Top Church in helping improve the biodiversity up there, along with Trevor Jones and the Vickers and everyone who's been volunteering up there. Donna's going to lead this second segment of the, uh, the talk tonight and give us a chance to ask some questions and talk to the panel. So I'm um, handing over to you, Donna. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very proud to be part, I just want to say I'm very proud to be part of this group. Um, wildlife is in serious trouble and this group has really stepped up um, despite COVID, the wills have been kept on and um, this whole project um, could have fallen over, but it's been, it's been fantastic. Um, now, there are a few questions that have been coming in. I've been looking at the Facebook page to see what questions are coming in. And um, I've got one for Tracy, actually. Um, so it's from Kate Hopkins. And Kate says, does the town council do the annual cut or do the volunteers cut and remove them, the cuttings themselves? So uh, hi there. Yeah. So hello, Kate. <laughs> good, good question. So at the moment, we've actually done a bit of a management plan for the town council um, and the uh, Devon County Council who actually don't manage any of these verges anymore. So it's kind of down to the town council to sort of try and um do something about that with along with be wild so we've got a bit of a mixed approach really so um some of the the big verges by the larger roads will be kept by a contractor but there's quite a lot of opportunities for various activities with some of the smaller verges around town um so we're hoping that there'll be some kind of cutting sessions and there's some quite enthusiastic scythe um, <laughs> owners that are very keen to do some scything on the verges and um, we're really open to some ideas actually about where where we can get rid of some of the cuttings from so the bits that we did this year um, they went up to the allotment some people put them on their compost heaps I certainly put quite a lot of them on mine <laughs> um, so we're definitely going to have to investigate that a little bit more so it's going to be a bit of a mixed approach really you have a bit of contractor stuff where it's a bit faster on some of the faster sections but lots of opportunities for seed sowing seed collecting um maybe even getting some people to grow some little plug plants that we can put into some of them so lots of things to do and hopefully bring your ideas as well to us i think that's one of the kind of key things that we're quite keen because this week this year because of because of lockdown it's I feel like we've been sort of in tunnel vision really we've just been sort of out doing stuff on our own and it's really nice to get a few more people involved I don't know does that answer your question I rambled on a bit there didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I think it does I hope it I hope Kate's pleased with that I think it does so thank you Tracy um I think we're going to have the whole panel up on screen now Yep, I think we're going to have the whole team up and we're right here. A few more questions have come in. OK, um, this is going to be aimed at this is for David. I'd like to attract swifts to nest on my house. What should I do? Are they a problem if they nest in my loft? You're unmuting. Um, <laughs> they are not a problem, I believe. That's a personal opinion. Um, they make a very scant nest. 
they require a small hole into the loft space or you can um, put a nest box on the outside which we can indeed supply you with if you contact us. Um, the uh, a process of uh, attracting will depend um, on how close you are to existing nest sites. Um, this is why we have a, what we're calling the swift caller because they, they sort of like nesting together, they, they nest in colonies and uh, the presence of one or more swifts will attract others but getting them back into a particular location where they've become, uh, you know, they've, they've not, no longer nested, it's a little bit tricky. So it depends where you are. And we do, when we look at a nest, a uh, possible location for a nest box, we do um, consider their access because the birds have a particular ecology. So we need to look at uh, the particulars of the environment where you propose to put the box. Um, does that, I think that's about it. I don't want to ramble on too much. Does that answer the question, do you feel? Yeah, I think that's a, I think you've answered it. Thank you, David. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay, um, I think now I've got a question for, this one will be for Robbie. Where's the best place to put up a bird box in my garden? And do I need a particular kind of box? Right, I should be unmuted now. Um, if you're going to get a bird box for your garden, the best thing to get is a box that's got a like a hole at the front rather than an open front because there's more birds that will use this type of design than an open fronted box. Um, and it's also good to go from quite a large hole, so 32 millimetres is the best because then you'll get house sparrows and great tits possibly use it, not just the smaller blue tits. Um, where you want to put a box up, it's best to put it up either on the side of a shed or on a tree if you've got a large enough tree in the garden. But the key thing to do is to have the box positioned relatively near some branches or some twigs that birds can fly and land on before they actually go into the box. So birds won't like to fly a long distance to a hole when they're first checking out the box. So it's always good to have it placed near some other undergrowth so they can hide away in and come out and go in the box nice and safely. You can put these boxes up any time of the year, but particularly in the sort of late winter is the best time when the birds are looking for a new place to nest for the spring. I think that's everything. Yeah, thank you very much, Robbie. That's really comprehensive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I've now got a question for, well, this is probably for, for John, actually. Um, what can I do to help bees? I don't have room for a beehive. Well, <laughs> well, there are lots of other bees. Um, there's, I mean, around town, we've probably got about 50 or 60 different species of bee. So um, you don't necessarily need to just attract honeybees. I mean, the people keep bees around town, but if you want to attract some of the solitary bees, and as I said, I will produce a guide to these, so you'll know a little bit more about these. And the good thing to do is have a, just a range of different flowers in your garden, starting with the springtime. So some of the first solitary bees come out in about March time, very early March. So if you grow plants like lungwort and things like that, at that time of year, that will attract those in. And then have a succession of different flowers right through the summer. And then it's just finished off in our garden. We've got some Michaelmas daisies and uh, some Caryopteris as well, which is just finishing flowering. So it's having that range of flowers right through the season and variety of different flowers. And as I said, I will produce a guide to this. So uh, hopefully we'll have more information out there in the spring. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so a couple more questions. Um, this one is for, for Joe. Um, Joe, this is somebody's, um, email to say my neighbor insists on using pesticides and slug pellets which I know are bad for wildlife is there anything I can say that might persuade might persuade them to switch to more nature friendly ways of gardening I would say to them um, that actually hedgehogs are really good at controlling a lot of the pests that that we have in our gardens so using slug pellets and other pesticides that are actually harming those creatures is kind of counterintuitive really. There are some really good alternatives. Some uh, you can get wool pellets to deter slugs 
um, trying to use companion planting and things. So lots of ways that you can work with nature rather than against it. Um, that helps all of the garden, helps all of the natural enemies of the of the pests we have on plants as well. And um, yeah, using that way, working with it rather than against it, I think is, is the way I would go. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, that's fantastic. Okay, and I, I'm going to open this up. A question, final question for the panel is, um, so for this is for anybody who would like to answer this. I only have a small garden, but I'd like to attract more wildlife. Can the panel tell me the three things they'd recommend that I do? So who hasn't um, um, joined in and who, or who would like to answer that one? Tracy? Tracy? I could put in a couple of things. <laughs> I think Please do. Um, probably John's... Uh, key person for this but hopefully I won't say anything that's wrong. <laughs> a pond is brilliant, it's probably the single best thing that you could do. Um, having some trees and shrubs in your garden, preferably ones that produce some berries um, for birds or flowers for pollinators but it also provides places for birds to nest and perches for them as well. Um, and the other thing is a compost heap. So many things live in your compost heap. Um, all sorts of stuff from, from slow worms and grass snakes to, you know, lots of little invertebrates and things as well. So those have been my top three. So someone else might have some other others to add. Well, that's, that's a good list. Thank you, Tracy. Excellent. Yes. Has anybody else got anything else they'd like to add? I was, I don't know if this is just a sort of reverse engineering kind of thing. Is is this is it's just a, a thought really. Not I'm a huge expert, but the kind of do nothing approach is like the abs the absence of the slug pellets, the absence of fertilizers, the absence of bought in plants, the absence of uh, the com the commodity uh, that is gardening world sort of thing, and observe. Look, look at what is, is around, look at what grows, and um, then be selective. Thank you. That's, that's, that's sound advice. Thank you very much, David. Um, final, any more, anyone else who'd like to, final one thing? John, can you think of anything else you might add? Uh, well, I'd agree with all of that. That's what I would have said, actually. So, um, yeah, be a little bit messy, you know, have a messy sort of corner, as Tracy said, have a, you know, a pile of logs, as well as a compost heap is a good thing. So maybe that, I'll just add that one in. So a pile of dead logs, if you've got space for it in a corner, it's a good place for all sorts of things to live in there, frogs and things will live under it, all sorts of stuff. So it's a, a good little, good little thing to have in the corner of your garden if you've got space, a pile of dead logs. Brilliant. <laughs> Um, have we got time for a few more? There's a few more that have come in um, on Facebook. Um, this one's from Charlie Scullion, and he says, is there any evidence that local wildlife has been given an advantage this year during lockdown? Have there been any sightings this year that are particularly unusual or special? Maybe, John, if you're still on screen, you'd like to answer that one. Um, it's, it's a bit hard to tell, really. I mean, there's because we've been around town a lot long, a lot more than usual, I have certainly. Uh, I've seen quite a lot of different things, um, but I wouldn't say anything that I've noticed particularly uh, done well in because of lockdown, um, personally. Um, so, so no, it, it's a bit sort of a two of a short, short term thing really to, uh, to say. Yes, but, um, but I think people have been getting closer to nature haven't they because because of lockdown people have been walking close to home oh, right, yeah. things a lot yeah. more and well, I think noticing things as well I think a lot of people have actually because they've had the time especially as lockdown came in the spring with all that lovely weather which was just you know the time when all those spring flowers are coming out so people had the time just actually to walk around and notice things and that, that is a, a major plus out of all of this okay Great, thank you. Now, Pam, I know Pam would like to say a few words. 
No, I was just going to answer that question. And um, I think one of the things that I noticed, and I think probably you might have done as well, Donna, was with lockdown, the verges weren't cut at peak time. So um, some of the orchids that grow in our verges managed to survive um, because they weren't cut at exactly the wrong time. So this year we had an abundance of all sorts of orchids, early purple orchids and all sorts of other orchids that John can name. We also had for the first time, I think, a pyramidal orchid, didn't we? On one we of did. the verges, which is unusual. We did. That was because uh, the verges weren't cut. So it just shows you how they can flourish. That's very true, actually. That's that's fun. That is very true because it was the pyramidal orchid actually that came up and it was the only one that was spotted in the parish. But unfortunately, it did get cut by Devon County Council when they got back into the swing of cutting for the visibility splays and it got cut. But um, we have spoken to them and they are now looking at not cutting um, that patch next year, which is good news. Okay, I'm just having a look to see if there is um, anything else that is uh, that we've got because I know we're coming up close to winding up, aren't we? Um, Susan Clark um, would like to say that when you tell people you live in Buckfastly, they used to say, "Oh, the home of the tonic wine," and now they say, "Oh, the place with the bats." I think that's great, and she says, "Great job, great job, guys," which is really lovely. So um, I think that um, we're now, you know, we're at eight, or, yeah, eight twenty-nine. Um, I think that um, everybody has been, well, been fantastic tonight. We've had some, some fantastic talks, and as I say, I think it's it's a wonderful achievement. Everything that's been carried out this year, despite all the setbacks. Um, and you can join our mailing list to be kept informed of all our activities. That's if you want to find out about the projects happening next year. Um, and um, we will be posting up on Facebook and, and through our email exchange, um, all the activities that we'll be carrying on with. So thank you and I'll hand over to Pam. Thank you very much, Donna, and thank you for all the work you've been doing, Donna. I know you've not done a presentation tonight, but I know how much work you've put into making the other projects happen, and particularly the work at the Top Church, which I know everybody adores and has enjoyed seeing this year so much. So thank you too. So that does wrap up our um, very spot on timely presentation today. I'm super impressed with the quantity, quality and timeliness of, of our presentations. It's been brill. Um, as Donna said, if you want to join our mailing list, you can um, see find details on our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram accounts, and also on YouTube. So if you look for Be Book Fastly or Be Wild, you'll find us on there. You can email uh, Robbie, who's at the other end of Bookfastly Be Wild at gmail.com. And we'd really like to hear from you if you've got ideas of wildlife projects you'd like to see happening over winter and as we move into next year. So watch our pages and do take the opportunity to get involved again um, when the next projects come round. So thank you all very much. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to all the viewers who've uh, been watching and asking questions. And we'll see you out in Bookfastly very soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.